on july tenth nineteen forty five admiral william halsey's third fleet closed to within a hundred fifty miles of mainland japan the japanese home islands represented the last major target of the united states navy attacking them was the culmination of more than three years worth of obstinate combat at last the navy had the enemy's homeland almost in sight and from its position off the coast it had the opportunity to deliver the knockout blow halsey was determined almost obsessed with sinking every japanese capital ship that had been involved in the war before peace could be reached he wanted to ensure that japan's navy would be defeated in his mind unconditional surrender involved total annihilation of japan's war machine on the morning of july tenth hundreds of u s carrier planes took off from his fast carrier task force called task force thirty eight and executed the first of several massive air raids against installations in mainland japan on that first day halsey's pilots aimed for the airfields outside of tokyo then on july fourteenth and fifteenth they hit train yards on hokkaido and northern honshu then for the last thirteen days of july they participated in five additional raids designed to sink all the japanese ships that lay at anchor on the third raid halsey instructed his aviators to find and sink the imperial fleet's most prized target nagato a battleship which had once been the flagship of the japanese fleet in some ways the raid against the nagato was strategically worthless at the time the ship was in nearly helpless condition the previous month the japanese had removed all of nagato's secondary guns and half of its anti-aircraft battery to boost its shore defenses destroying the battleship would not it seemed hasten the end of the war still the japanese were prepared to defend the toothless battleship at its berth in yokosuka they had camouflaged nagato so it could not be seen from the air additionally the japanese parked it near a museum ship the mikasa which had served as admiral togo's flagship during the 1905 battle of tsushima hopefully the mikasa's presence would lead the americans to conclude that nagato had been mothballed and that the whole area could be avoided on july eighteenth strike groups from the carriers yorktown cowpens shangri-la and randolph tested their luck glide bombing nagato from ten thousand feet twenty-year-old radio men second class george william whitehurst of torpedo squadron eighty eight was in the belly of a tbm avenger flown by lieutenant douglas lapierre whitehurst recalled the frightening moments as his squadron plummeted through the hail of anti-aircraft fire in their effort to deal a death blow to the japanese battleship peeling off at ten thousand feet amidst heavy anti-aircraft fire nine of the planes dove on the target the procedure called for the bombers to pull out three thousand feet dropping their bombs as they did so in my case what followed was a harrowing experience my pilot did not pull out at three thousand feet and when i did not feel the g's that is the sensation of pulling out of the dive I looked over my shoulder and saw the altimeter needle passing 3,000 feet, then 2,000, and finally stopping at just under 1,000 feet. Alarmed, I called the pilot on the intercom and I was told to take a look at the left wing where a 40 millimeter shell had struck, opening a large hole. The pilot had made a long, shallow pull out to save pressure on the wing. He said that we had been hit at 6,000 feet and he had jettisoned the bomb, knowing that it would have been fatal to try to complete the dive with it. And where did that Urant bomb fall? You guessed it. The Mikasa is about three quarters of the mile of the Nagato, and it suffered a direct blow. For a 1904 ship, that was devastating. The Japanese could never understand why the Americans would want to bomb an old ship that was on land, and they refused to believe that it was a mistake. Two decades after the war, in an effort to prove their sincerity, the U.S. Navy helped restore Mikasa to its former appearance. Carrier planes pounded Nagato all day, and the ship suffered so much bomb damage that it eventually settled on the harbor bottom, unable to be moved. It could not sink because the harbor depth was too shallow. As a result, it was the only Japanese battleship to survive World War II. For the next 10 days, Halsey's aviators repeated their performance against other naval installations, including a massive four-day raid against Kure Naval Base. 
but none of this did anything to break down Japanese resistance. U.S. Army Air Force bombers had been saturating Japanese cities with incendiary bombs for five months, and still the Japanese government refused to surrender. To casual observers, the addition of the Navy's bombing campaign seemed to have no tangible effect on Imperial Japan's decision to continue its resistance. However, on August 6th and August 9th, the situation changed dramatically when Army Air Force bombers deployed atomic weapons over the cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, killing perhaps as many as 200,000 people, soldiers and civilians alike. When word of the successful atomic bombings reached the fleet at sea, the sailors exploded with joy, believing that this news was the war's final act. Japan had finally been brought to its knees. All the United States had to do was wait for Emperor Hirohito to come to his senses. But the American aviators were sorely mistaken. Even though atomic weapons had been deployed, Admiral Halsey refused to bring an end to the Navy's bombing missions. He wanted the Navy to be in at the close, so he continued ordering missions over Japan. He scheduled three more raids for August 10th, 13th, and 15th. On August 13th, Radium and Whitehurst was back in the air for his 10th strike over the mainland, and he was not happy about it. He saw little value in bombing Japanese civilians to conclude a war that had already been won. He recalled, We were carrying a 2,000-pound bomb, so large that it filled the bomb bay. My torpedo squadron was assigned a fishing village in a cove where some coastal vessels were anchored. I knew that not a few of our bombs would fall in that village with devastating consequences. I really didn't want us to bomb that village and called Lieutenant Lapierre on the intercom about it. He cut me off, saying that we were assigned our target and we would try to hit those small ships, so that's where we were going. So over we went, and as I suspected, some of the bombs fell in the village and heaven knows how many people we killed. In a sweep over a nearby airfield, we lost a fighter pilot to an anti-aircraft fire. The pilot was Lieutenant Wilson L. Dozier of Norfolk. This account isn't in my flight log. We will wonder why I wanted to spare a fishing village, but was earlier willing to stray farms. In retrospect, I know this was an inconsistency, since both were civilian targets, but I was 20 years old and simply made choices. One of the most dangerous missions took place on the morning of August 15, 1945. That day, USS Yorktown's Fighting Squadron 88 took off with 12 planes. Its mission was to sweep Atsugi Airfield, which was well protected by anti-aircraft guns. Fighting Squadron 88's pilots flew the Grumman F-6F Hellcat, a single-seat fighter plane. Their job was to clear the way for bombers and torpedo planes, each armed with a 2,000-pound bomb, that would come in a few minutes later to crater the runway and hangars. Early in the mission, several of the planes got lost in the overcast, leaving only six planes to perform the sweep. The pilots were Lieutenant Howdy Harrison, Ensign Billy Hobbs, Ensign Eugene Mandeberg, Lieutenant J.G. Joseph Saloff, Lieutenant J.G. Ted Hansen, and Lieutenant J.G. Mari Proctor. As the Hellcats winged their way toward Atsugi, good news came over the airwaves. While they were in the air, Admiral Chester Nimitz's message arrived aboard USS Yorktown and suspended all further combat operations. The war was over. The carrier relayed this news to the men flying the mission, instructing them to jettison their ordnance and return to the ship. Unfortunately, the message did not reach the six pilots of Fighting Squadron 88 in time. They were already reaching Atsugi Airfield when they received the news. Quickly, they breezed over the airfield without firing a shot and began their return trek. Undoubtedly, they felt elated, but for these men, peace would last only a few minutes. About five miles from Atsugi Airfield, midway between the runway and the coast, 20 Japanese fighters attacked them. The news of war's end had not yet reached any of their adversaries. It was a recipe for slaughter. Not only were these Japanese aircraft some of the newest and best remaining, but the talented pilots who flew them, hoarded by the Japanese to defend their homeland against an anticipated land assault, represented the most skilled and experienced flyers in the land. 
The Hellcat pilots realized their predicament when Lieutenant J.G. Sailoff spotted them coming in at high speed. From his cockpit, he radioed, Tally-ho! Many rats! Six o'clock high! Diving! With that, the fight was on. The last important air battle of the Pacific War now ensued. Outnumbered more than three to one, the Americans didn't stand a chance. Sailoff was the first shot down. He tried to get to open water, but he didn't make it. His plane went down and landed with a tremendous splash in Tokyo Bay. Next, Proctor's plane was riddled. It received 28 holes from enemy fire, and he was forced to dive for a lower altitude and head back to Yorktown. Then, another Hellcat exploded in fire, forcing its pilot to parachute from 7,000 feet. Two others took heavy fire as well, and they too plummeted in flames, smashing into the ground. The last pilot, Ted Hansen, who fended off the Japanese and subsequently made it back to Yorktown, was so occupied with defending himself that he had no time to identify which of his three companions had parachuted out and which had ridden their planes to a fiery end. Four men, Billy Hobbs, Howdy Harrison, Eugene Mandeberg, and Joseph Saloff, had died knowing the war was over and that they were being killed in a pointless skirmish. On USS Yorktown, Hansen and Proctor landed their damaged Hellcats on the flight deck and told their tale. Yorktown's flag officer, Rear Admiral Arthur Radford, who had earlier agonized over greenlighting this mission, later wrote, These were our last combat casualties. Their loss was a personal tragedy to me on this day of victory. Thus, the Navy's final battle in the Pacific War was a defeat, one that dampened the mood of the pilots on USS Yorktown. While the other ships of the task group were celebrating the end of the war, they were engulfed in anger and frustration. In expletive-filled tirades, they castigated Admiral Halsey for insisting on these last air missions over Japan. At that point, such sacrifices hardly seemed necessary to the men. One Yorktown aviator summed up his emotions with a poem. He wrote, The last tally-ho has been sounded. The sea washes thick with the tears. Remember the ranks of the fallen, as memory fades with the years. Ensign John Willis bore the unenviable task of writing to Eugene Mandeberg's family and letting them know that his friend, who everyone called Mandy, would not be coming home. Willis wrote, Ironically enough, he died on the very morning the peace was reached. Six of our boys were to go over Tokyo and make an attack on an airfield in the vicinity. Just as they got to the target, a dispatch was sent over the air that the war was over and that all flights were to return to the carrier. Our boys were overjoyed, I know, at the prospect of no more fighting. Along the way home, they were jumped by 20 enemy fighters. Of course, during a melee such as this must have been, our fellows lost contact with each other. Only two of the six returned. No one seems to know what happened to the other four, among whom was Mandy. The two returning pilots had definitely shot down five enemy planes. Our gains were noticeable, but our losses were overwhelming. We hoped that perhaps a couple of the boys would have gotten to Earth safely and been taken prisoner. I don't want to say for you to give up hope, but at the same time, I also don't want you to build up your hopes too high. Perhaps I'm wrong in saying these things, but I believe anxiety to be much more difficult to bear than resignation. The world I know has lost a fine fellow and an intelligent compatriot. But as for myself, and for the rest of my squadron mates, we have lost a friend. It's so difficult to express in writing what a man feels in his heart. I'm not capable of the fluency in writing that was one of your son's many accomplishments. My sincerest regrets to you, who have suffered so much. I'll close now with sorrow in my heart. Ensign John Willis, Fighting Squadron 88
The result of the last dog fight over Tokyo reminds us of a certain truth about war, that even in victory there is grief.